I wonder how many of you, uh, if any of you, are familiar with the fundamental attribution error. Have you ever heard of the fundamental attribution error? It's, the, it's a cognitive bias, if you're not familiar with us. It's a cogni cognitive bias that causes us to attribute another person's, another person's behavior to their character. For example, you're driving down the freeway on your way to work, and uh, you come to a place where the traffic is merging, and everybody can see that traffic is merging, and you're driving along the way, and there's, uh, the right lane is clear now because everybody's moving over, except for that one guy who passes everybody on the right and goes all the way up to the front of the line and cuts over, and you're thinking, that person is just rude and inconsiderate. How could they be so um, inconsiderate of other people? They're, just, they're, they're, they're terrible people. I hate people who drive like that. And you get to work, and when you get to work, um, you, you look over, and, and Ted's desk, desk is empty, and, and Ted's late again, and you did all that you needed to do. You fought traffic. You got there. You got to work on time, and, and Ted's late, and Ted's late because Ted is just, he's irresponsible, and, and, and Ted is lazy. It, it, the people drive like that because they're just, they're just mean, nasty people, and, and people are late because they're just irresponsible, lazy people. But... On that one occasion when you're the person who really, really has some place to be and you need to get there on time, and so you cut down that right lane and you even put, but everyone, if they knew your situation, they would understand that you're not a rude person, you're not a, you're not a disrespectful driver, that you really have a, a legitimate reason for why you're doing what you're doing. And, and on that day that you're late for work, you're not late because you're lazy or you're not irresponsible. You're late because, you know, your, your kid was sick this morning and you had to drop him off at the in-laws and, and you had to help your mom out on the, on the way. And, and there are things in your life and circumstances that, that justify your, your uh, tardiness on, on a given day, that when we look at people, we, we judge their character by their actions. And we don't consider their circumstances, their situation, but we judge our character, our, our actions, in, in light of our character, right? It's a, the fundamental attribution error. We don't judge other people we don't judge our, ourselves the same way that we judge other people. And when it comes to the political scene, right, we look at people on the other side of the political aisle. And we think, you know what, the, the, those Democrats, they're just all a bunch of, just a bunch of uh, liberals and, and they're tolerant of everybody except for the people who disagree with them. They're just intolerant people of everybody, but the people that are tolerant, they're just, they're rude and they're, and they're inconsiderate and there's so much corruption in the Democratic Party and it's just because, it's because they're, 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 just, they're bad people. And we look at the other side of the aisle, we look at the, the Republicans, you know, those, the Republicans are just heartless. They just they don't care about anybody else. They're just worried about their taxes and, and, and their situation and their life. And, and they're just, they're heartless, rude people. And we judge people along the political line, in, in this, along this, the, with the same cognitive bias. We're not looking at their situation. We're not looking at their circumstances. We're looking at their actions and attributing those actions to their character. And, and it flies back and forth both ways. And the political rhetoric that we're surrounded by, it, it feeds this. But you know what? Mature people... They don't fall for this. People who are mature, people who are emotionally intelligent, people who, um, who are um, thoughtful and empathetic of other people, they don't, they don't fall for this error. Right? The, the, you're better than that. You might, you might see it in another person, and, and you might say, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. you know what? You're, what you're doing here is, is you're falling for the fundamental attribution error, and they're looking at you going, huh? It's like, yeah, I heard this great sermon, and, and, and the pastor talked about how we sometimes we judge people by their actions, we judge their character, and instead of looking at their circumstances. And, and so you're, you're on that per, the, the side that says, no, 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 we, you, we don't do, we don't judge people that way. We're empathetic. I, I used to be like that, but I don't do that anymore. When we choose to carry someone's burdens... We talked about listening. 
to other people, learning about their circumstances, their context, why it is that they see the world the way that they see it. Why, it is, why is it that they're afraid of the things that they're afraid of or, or want the things that they want? When we walk alongside of people, what divides us diminishes. And what unites us surfaces. We fear less and we understand more. It's how the world, how the church began. If you go back to the roots of the church, we're going to look at that this morning. Go back to the roots and how the church got its start, how it laid its foundations, and it's how the world changed. We're in our third week, in our last week, of a series um, that I've uh, adopted the outline. I want to give credit where credit's due from Andy Stanley, um, pastor of a church in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, the, he, his subtitle for this series was The uh, Talking Points, The Perfect Blend of Politics and Religion. And what we've been saying throughout this series is that the church ought to be the safest place in the world for people to come together, even among our disagreements, and, and still love each other and still do life together. And the question that we've been wrestling with throughout this series, the, the key question is this, are we willing to put our faith filter what it is that we believe because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus has done about the world and about other people, are we willing to put our faith filter above our political filter? Are we willing to be Christians first and Republicans and Democrats or independents or libertarians second? Are we willing to put Jesus first? When we do that, Things change in culture and in society. And, and if we don't do that, as followers Jesus, of Jesus, if we don't do that, we do the world a disfavor. Because they don't get to see the real Jesus. They don't get to see the real good news of the kingdom of God. Because Jesus is not a footnote to our political party. Jesus did not come to like make an existing system better or to improve, to improve upon it. Last week, we, Jesus didn't come to take sides. Jesus came to take over. Jesus came to launch a new kingdom. He came to reverse the order of things as they existed in the world. When we edit Jesus to fit into our political platforms, we lose the message that changed the world. We cannot find, we cannot be first and foremost party people. And I'm not talking about your homecoming uh, dance or, or your freshman year of college. We cannot, first and foremost, we cannot be party people. We must be kingdom people who use our influence to influence others, who use our influence to influence our parties. When we're forced to choose between the lesser of two evils, rather than saying, well, this evil is less evil than that evil, so I'm going to overlook the, the evils that are this evil and only focus on all the evils on, that are that evil and not on the good parts. When we reduce everything and we focus on the lesser, we have to call out the evil that remains even in the lesser of the two evils. Not for our sake, for the world's sake. This is, this is a really, really big deal. This is, this is such a big deal that the first century followers of Jesus, that, that, those, Jesus, that those followers who, who were alive and when Jesus died and, and was resurrected and at the ascension and, and at Pentecost and, and carried the, the message of the kingdom forward after the ascension. I, that this was so important. This was such a big deal that they were willing to die for it. They refused unconditional allegiance to the emperor of Rome. Even the good ones, at great personal risk, 
And, when, and because they did it, and because of the way that they did it, they actually moved the moral and ethical point of the kingdom forward, of the empire of Rome. They did this. They accomplished this by, a way, by the way of culturally disruptive unity. Culturally disruptive unity. In a world that was organized around power and wealth and citizenship, where people were able to purchase their way if they had the means and the resources up the social standing social ladder. In that kind of world, the church of Jesus stood against all the things that divided and all the ways that, that, that culture divided people stood against them and, and ignored those walls within their community, within their fellowship, tore those walls down. And, and their disregard for the norms, for the way things were and the way that things were supposed to work, their disregard for those norms disrupted, disturbed the order of the empire. It's why Rome was so determined to stamp out this movement. we got to stop this because they're, they're, they're tearing apart the very fabric of our kingdom. The classes of people whose circles rarely overlapped. On very rare occasions, they were forced into, into, um, into each other's presence, but, but almost never... In, in that culture, in, in that context, these followers of Jesus from, from different sides of all of these issues, they would come together voluntarily, regularly to worship the crucified God. Why? Why did they ignore the, the norms of their day? Why did they look past those things? Why did they ruffle the feathers? Why did they disrupt the kingdom? Because the good news that Jesus preached, the message that he shared, the kingdom that he declared, the kingdom that he ushered in, contended that everyone was welcome to participate in it. Everyone was invited. I, I was... Um, in my early days of ministry, I was in, in youth ministry, and I was talking to a, a young kid, one, a young guy one day, and, and this was, it was a while ago, um, and he, it was in the early days of Christian rock. And um, I was advocating for Christian rock music, and, and, and this young man says, it's not, it's not tenable. It's not, he didn't use the word tenable. He said, there, there, there can't be a, such a thing as Christian rock because rock music by its nature, is countercultural. So if it's Christian, it can't be rock because Christians are not countercultural. And if you go back to the first century church, you could not be more wrong. This message was so incredibly countercultural to the world that it was being interest, introduced to that we can hardly imagine how deeply divisive Paul's words, for example, where we're going to look at a passage, and this is in Galatians chapter 3. Paul writes to the church in Galatia. He says this, So in Christ Jesus, so in Christ Jesus, in Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourselves with Christ. And this is where it goes off the rails. All of you are children of God through faith, baptized through Christ, clothe yourselves with Christ, so that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Wait, what? What? You said in Christ there are, there's no Jew nor Gentile, right? That, that, that now those barriers, now they're, they're broken down, that Jews and Gentiles, like a Jew never went to the home of a Gentile, and a Gentile would never go to the home of a Jew. And Jews looked down at their, their nose at the Gentiles because the, the Jews were the chosen people. 
And, and the Gentiles looked down their noses at the Jewish people because they were just like this religious sect and they weren't getting along and getting, you know, living up to the, to the day and into the times. A Jew and a Gentile would never hang out together. In fact, if you go to Acts chapter 10, it's actually the, the story of the first encounter between Christians and Jews, the first sanctioned encounter between Christians and Jews in the post-Jesus um, ascension era. And it's Peter who goes to the home of this guy named Cornelius, who was a, a Roman centurion. And, and the, the dialogue is just like so awkward because they don't know how to be together except they've had this, this um, encounter that has brought them together. And, and Peter's like, you know what, I don't, I don't do this. I don't, I don't come to the house of, of Gentiles, but, but here I am. And kind of like literally insults his host. And his host says, well, I don't really, you know, know what you're supposed to do here. But, but I was told to sin for you, so talk. And, and it's on that occasion that the Spirit is poured out on the Gentiles for the first time. And suddenly it becomes evident to everyone who's there that the Gentiles, Jews and the Gentiles, are actually one. And they're all a part of this kingdom. Okay, so, so we're getting past these religious cultural barriers. But, but slave and free, you're breaking down the economic barriers also? What? God views slaves and masters as equals? Right? Remember last week, some were living in a, we're talking about a culture where some were born to rule and some were born to be ruled, and it was self evident. It's just the way things were. And now you're telling me that we're all on equal standing. It was so disruptive to that culture that the seeds of revolution were being so sown not through. Violence, not through taking, through unity. And then, okay, Jews, Gentiles, but but women and men too, uh, of equal value. That, that women, in the in the good news of the kingdom of God and the reorientation that Jesus introduced, are actually reminded again of Genesis, what it says at the beginning, are image bearers of God. And as image bearers, integral to the family of God, that they are equal to men. It's like... No, no, you, you can't say this. You can't, what, what if the women find out about this? What are they going to, you know, they're going to like revolt and overthrow and, and not listen to their husbands. It's going to be chaos everywhere. Because Paul says, for you are all one. You are all one in Christ Jesus. This means one as in no distinction between Jews and Gentiles, and slave and free, between male and female. All people are of equal dignity. And this brought wholesale change. If it caught, if what was happening among these Christians, if it caught on, it would unravel the kingdom. And it's why it's, it's so foolish so foolish for us today to allow cultural divisions to divide us, to allow political parties to tear us apart. Because one day, the parties will be gone, but Jesus will still be king. Jesus predicted that the kingdom would change the world. He says this in Luke chapter 16. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. The, the Old Testament, the, the law, the prophets, Moses, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all those guys, the law and the prophets were preached until John. He's talking about John the Baptist. But he says, since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached it's being spread out. It's being sent out to the world. 
And he says, and everyone predicting the future, and everyone is forcing their way into it. As it goes out, everyone's jumping on board. What Jesus said is actually exactly what happened. Fast forward 45 years after Paul was executed, 45 years after the death of Peter. Now, what I'm saying, think about this. Peter was the, the, the leading disciple and, and the head of the ministry to the Jewish um, extension of the Christian faith. Paul was the missionary to the, and the leader of the Gentile mission. These are like the superheroes of the faith, the, the, the leaders of their day. They were both executed, persecuted by Rome. And so at this point, you would think, hey, they just lost that. They just lost their two major leaders. Things are going to be all downhill from here. 45 years later, the movement continues to spread. Paul's dead. Peter's dead. And, and Rome is starting, this, this great empire is starting to fray around the edges. And they're trying to figure out, hey, what's going, what's going wrong? Why, why is the empire on, on um, shaky ground? And what's happening here? And their conclusion was, hey, it's because we're not, we're not offering our sacrifices to the gods like we used to. And why aren't we doing that? Well, it's because these Christians don't sacrifice to our gods. And, and so we've got to stop these Christians. We've got to stamp out this movement. We've got to get everybody worshiping at the altars of our gods again and get everything back in alignment so the kingdom will, will flourish. And so martyrs, persecution is, is going on throughout the empire to stamp out the Christian movement. And during this time, Pliny the Younger was a Roman governor in the province that, is, that we now know as Turkey. And he sees the problem. He understands what his orders are. So he, he's supposed to go out and, and arrest these, these Christians and... and, and um, contain the movement so it, so it stops the pre- spread so they can preserve the integrity of the kingdom. And so he decides that, that he needs to know why, what it is that's so threatening about the Christians. Why are they such a threat? Why do we need to stop this movement? And he sends out his spies. And, and after he, he does this, he sends a report back to imp- the Emperor Trajan to, to, give, to tell him what he sees is going on with these Christians. And this is what he writes in his letter. Plenty of the Younger writes to the Emperor Trajan. He says, The sum and substance of their fault or error, these Christians, had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn. What he's referring to is on Sunday morning, the, the Christians would get together to celebrate the resurrection. And, and Sunday was a work day. And, and so they would, before dawn, they would go out before they had to go to work. And they would get together to worship this crucified God. Now, think about that. Think about what our church service would be like if I said, you know what, we can't, we're going to start doing church on Monday morning at 6 a.m. Right? How many people would be here? These are our people. This is our story. They were so devoted, so committed to the church, to the, to the mission of the kingdom of God, that on, on the first work day of the week, Monday morning, right? It's Monday. They went, got together to worship. What did they do when they get there? In his report, they'd sing songs to Christ like he's some kind of God. The next time we sing a song, and maybe it's not your favorite song, and you don't really like that song. Think about this. They're getting up 6 a.m. Monday morning to sing together to worship. This is how we began. And, and then he goes on. He says, and they would bind themselves to an oath. 
Oh, okay. This must be where it gets bad. This must, this must be where things go awry. Because, I mean, really, meeting together is not that big a deal, and singing is not that big a deal. But they're, they're taking an oath. This must, what, must be what makes them dangerous. Here's what he says. Not an oath to some common cause. Here's their oath. Not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery. Not to falsify their trust. Imagine, if, if every Christian in, in the world got together every Monday morning at 6 a.m. and said, okay, this week, this week, I'm not going to deceive anyone. I'm not going to trick them into a bad business deal. I'm not going to misrepresent myself or mis misrepresent my business in a way that, that deceives people. I'm not going to lie to anybody. I'm not going to steal from anybody. I'm going to be faithful to my spouse. I'm going to be true to my commitments. I'm going to let my yes be yes. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. If, I'm not, if I say I'm not going to do something, then I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to betray trust. If the church did that, if all followers of Jesus did that every week, what would, the, what would the outcome of that be? What would the result of that be? And, and plenty, of, plenty of the younger is like, this is what's angering the gods? This is what's threatening the empire? This is what must be eliminated. Well, what happened? In a culture that worshipped strength, victory, and conquest. The ruling class initially found this worship of Jesus who had been crucified, dead, and buried. They found it appalling. It's appalling. But for many, for many people who saw this upside down kingdom that the disciples, the followers of Jesus, were living into, they began to find it appealing that these, these Christians, they didn't abandon the sick people. They didn't like send them off to some remote village to die. That these children who were being left out, exposed because they were weaker or because they were unwanted or because that, that they would rescue them, that they would take them in, that they would raise them as their own. That they extended dignity to women and to slaves, even to children. Jordan Peterson, author, says it this way. He says, Christian, Christianity achieved the well-nigh impossible. The Christian doctrine elevated the individual soul, placing slave and master and commoner and nobleman alike on the same metaphysical footing, rendering them equal before God and the law. The implicit transcendent worth of each and every soul established itself against impossible odds. The kingdom of God is described by Jesus struck the ancients as, appeal, as appalling. But then for many it became appealing. And ultimately it became contagious. That against all odds, that, that what started out as this Nazarene sect began to unravel the kingdom. They had, they had no territory. They had no military. They had no authority. They had no political power. They had no standing in the community. And, and with a message built around two completely unacceptable policies to a first century Roman, pathetically weak ideas, love your enemy, love one another, not only did it survive, it reshaped the world. 
that we actually live in today. That we dare not be divided over party lines, knowing that those parties will one day be over. And and if those who came before us were willing to go to such great lengths to usher in this kingdom, it would be foolish for us to allow ourselves to be be divided. They found common ground that disrupted and and, and shocked the world and changed it. And so Tuesday, you probably heard there's a big election. And many people are saying that this is the most consequential election, election in a generation, maybe more. Some would say even since the days of Abraham Lincoln and, and the Civil War. I, I've read that 40% of both parties believe that democracy is in jeopardy based on the outcome of this election. The 20% of both parties, give or take, actually have said that they would consider taking up violence if their candidate doesn't win. And we run the risk of being divided over important, not, they're not, I'm not saying they're insignificant issues, imp, being divided over important issues, issues that we're passionate about. Issues that it may be impossible for you to understand how somebody could actually believe that that's the way things ought to be, that, they, that, that, that someone could believe that that's true, that someone could accept that as reality. Very important issues. I'm not minimizing any of this. But our history is people who had stood in the midst of incredibly important issues, challenging issues, issues that that laid at the very fabric of the kingdom and stood together as one. So, So let's follow the followers who followed Jesus. Vote, please, vote. Vote your law of Christ-informed conscience. Your law of Christ-informed conscience. What's the law of Christ? As I've loved you, Jesus said, so you must love one another. As that law informs your conscience, vote in faithfulness to that. In the meantime, let's do what the early church did. Let's do what the early church did. Let's carry each other's burdens. When you help me carry my burden, right, you, you see past the fundamental attribution error. You, you see where I'm walking in the world from where I see it, and you begin to understand my needs and my challenges and, and, and my struggles, and, and vice versa, right? When we carry each other's burdens, we start to see the world, feel the world from other people's perspective, and we may not agree, but we can agree to disagree politically and still love each other unconditionally. And in so doing, fulfill the law of Christ. Let's not miss this opportunity, this invitation to become followers of the king who reversed the order. There's going to be an election, and there's going to be a winner, and there's going to be a loser. And there's going to be a whole lot of of fear on one side and celebration on the other side, but but followers of Jesus. Can we stand together? Can we come together? Can we listen to one another? Can, Can we be students and not critics and learn from one another? 
Can we love one another as we've been loved by Christ, even amidst our passionate disagreements? Can we do what the first church did, the early church, coming together in spite of their differences, worshiping together, singing together, claiming our place and our responsibility and our calling to view everyone as an image bearer of God, loved by God, pursued by God, and live out our calling to love the Lord our God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourself, not the way that we want to be loved, not the way that we think they deserve to be, to love one another as Jesus loved us. And if we can do that, if we will do that, the right and the left will still yell and scream and everybody's going to be afraid. But we might just do what the early church did. And where there's division, bring unity. And where there's disrespect, offer dignity. Lord, I pray. I pray for our country in this week where there seems there's so much at stake and so much fear and so much anxiety and so much anger and so much misunderstanding and so much accusation and so much condemnation, so much division. Lord, you, you might fill us with the peace of Christ that it might rule in our hearts so that even in the midst of things that might cause us anxiousness, that might cause us fear, that we would not get taken away by it, but that we would find our foundation in Christ. Having been baptized and have been made one in Christ, that we might look around to our brothers and sisters and to, and to our communities and to our world and see people dearly loved by you and not compromise the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of our political agenda. But trust. Trust in you, Lord. Trust that one day, all these things that divide us, all the, the nations of the world, all the political parties that, are, that, that exist here and, and afar, that one day all of those walls will be torn down and there will be one king and one kingdom and that all who belong to you will live together in the renewal of all things. Lord, I pray let your kingdom come let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.